So the first section that we're going to look at is um, called the economy of salvation administered in him. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, that big chunk. The next section is union in Christ's exaltation, which is going to involve his um, resurrection, his ascension, and his uh, session at the right hand of the Father, and then um, being created anew in Christ. That's in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And then the rest of chapter 2 is the next section, a wall torn down to build one temple in him. Following that in section four, we're going to look at the dwelling place of Christ. He dwells in our hearts by faith. And you'll see that in Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 19, that little chunk at the end of uh, Ephesians chapter three. And then uh, we're going to look at um, the fifth section, the growth of the body. And that's in Ephesians chapter four, 14 through 16, that little section there. And then we're going to look at um, the sixth section, which is Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 32. And that, of course, is on um, the meaning and purpose of uh, God's ordinance in marriage. So let's look at the first section here. And uh, I want to try and stick really close to this outline that I've created. So let's read together Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So if you have your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 3. And I'm reading from NASB 95. (laughs) Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the uh, kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the kind intention which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heavens and the things on the earth. In him also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, you see how many times it's saying in him, in Christ, through him. These are... um, This is diction um, that revolves around this topic of union with Christ. In him, verse 13, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, we hope that that's gonna happen this morning, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So let's think about an outline for Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14. And as I was thinking about this, um, it struck me that really the outline is in verse three. Paul gives us an outline of this paragraph. So verse three, blessed be the God and father. That's verses four through six. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's verses uh, seven through 12 who has blessed us with every spiritual, now spiritual is, um, that word should be capitalized in your Bible. It it means um, of or pertaining to the work of the Holy Spirit. So, um, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And that's in um, verses 13 through 14. And that in Christ at the end of that verse describes what he's going to be talking about throughout the entire paragraph. Everything is about being um, blessed in Christ, the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, cool. So if you look at your first point under uh, section number one, salvation chosen by the Father in him. We're going to learn about what each person of the Trinity is responsible for in our salvation, what each person's role was. So Let me um, read a little excerpt to you out of this 
really awesome book. It's called From Heaven He Came in Solder. This is um, one of the first book, books that I read as a, uh, as a newly saved Christian. Might have, might have even been um, uh, responsible for my salvation. This book, awesome book. It's about the atonement of Christ. And listen to what he says on uh, page 334 of this book. He says, Soteriology, often referred to as the economy of salvation, may appear to be a systematic category, but it has biblical roots. The word economy is used in Ephesians 1.10. He quotes it. As an economy, and the word is oikonomion, that's the Greek word, so Clearly, we get our word economy from this Greek word, oikonomion, um, as an economy of the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ. He says, the verse is a high point of Paul's paragraph in um, chapter 1 through uh, 3 through 14. The word oikonomia describes the manner in which God's plan is being worked out in human history. As Fred Sanders writes, when Paul talks about God's economy, His point is that God is a supremely wise administrator who's arranged the elements of his plan with great care. In other words, God has a plan for salvation and here's his plan in Ephesians chapter one, three through 14. Make sense? So we're gonna look at God's plan for our salvation and we're gonna find out that it's not only involving Jesus Christ, it does involve the Father and it does involve the Holy Spirit. So verse four, just as he that he is referring to God the Father, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the beloved. So what role does the father take in our salvation? The father chooses. In other places, he said to foreordain. He predestines. He sets us apart in love. You see, the father's work is before the foundation of the the world, choosing a people for his own possession. That's what the father does. That's what the father is responsible for in our salvation. And he does it in the beloved. So in what sense can I say that I'm united to Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world? I didn't even exist at that time. So how in the world does Paul say that he chose us in the beloved before the foundation of the earth? He's able to say that because in the mind of God, He chooses us to be united to Jesus Christ. Make sense? Um, Union with Christ is something that takes place in time. Before I was saved, when I was a fornicator and when I was a um, a habitual liar, when I was a thief, um, when my my life was characterized by these things, um, I was not united to Christ. I got united to Christ in time when the Holy Spirit caused me to be born again. And yet, before the foundation of the earth, the Father set me apart to be united to his Son. Make sense? Okay, let's look at verse seven. And for the sake of time, we'll just look at this one verse for the work of the Son. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. So the work of the Father is a predestining work. It's a setting apart work before the foundation of the earth. The work of the son then, the second person of the Trinity, he was sent by the father to do what? To die for his people. Which people did he die for? He died for the people that God set apart. He died for the people that that God the father chose. Make sense? So God the father chooses a people out of the world, out of history. He chooses a certain group And he sends Jesus Christ to be a propitiatory sacrifice on behalf of that group. We have redemption through his blood. We're redeemed by the blood of Christ. Okay? Uh, The third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, his work is seen in verse 13. In him, 
You also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now to be sealed can mean several things in the Bible. To be sealed can mean, um, uh, it can be like marked as one's own possession. It can mean like sealing a letter so that you're ensuring that something isn't tampered with from the outside. Um, it can be a pledge, a down payment. All of these things are spoken of in reference to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So um, what does the father do? The father predestines. He sends the son to die on behalf of those people that the father predestines. And both the father and the son send the Holy Spirit to regenerate the hearts of those same people. Does that make sense? Do you see how God isn't like a cavalier, flippant, like, oh, I'll just, you know, sweep all their sins under the rug and I'm not gonna have a plan. I'll just, you know, flippantly, I'm, I'm gonna save a people. That's not the way that, um, that God works. He had a systematic plan before the foundation of the earth as to how he was particularly going to save a people. The father predestines. The son dies for those people and the Holy Spirit regenerates and seals them. He's given as a pledge for their inheritance. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay, cool. Let's move on to the second section. Union in his exaltation. Now in Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10, we could talk about all kinds of things, all kinds of things in reference to union with Christ. But I wanted to look at something that maybe we haven't really thought about much as Christians in our Christian walk. So um, as I'm teaching through this book, I wanna hit on points that we might not um, think about very deeply because we need to be thinking about um, God's plan for salvation at a new level. We need to be growing in our understanding. Does that make sense? So Ephesians chapter two, let's look at verse uh, four. But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, you see how the love of God, the, um, God's love is a work of the Father. The love of God, uh, I'm sorry, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. When was Christ made alive? You can say it. When was he made alive? I'm sorry? He was made alive at his resurrection, right? Jesus died on the cross. Three days later, he rose again, and that's when he was made alive. And yet, look at, uh, look at the next section of this verse. Uh, he made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him. So then, when was Christ raised up? What's the difference between Christ being raised up and him being um, made alive? What's the difference between those two things? They are talking, uh, Paul is talking about two different things. To be made alive, that's referring to Christ's resurrection. To be raised up isn't referring to his resurrection. It's referring to his ascension. Yeah, that's right. It's referring to his ascension. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So I'm gonna, like I said, I mean, we could talk about all kinds of things in Ephesians chapter two, one through 10, but I'm gonna specifically look at the, um, the way in which we're united to him in the likeness of his resurrection, ascension, and session at the right hand of God. Make sense? So we know the um, we know the the uh, what Paul is referring to when he says Christ was raised, ascended, and seated at the right hand of God. But what are the corresponding truths? What are the counterparts in the Christian life? How are we united to Christ in the likeness of those things? Um, anybody got a mic to pass around? How are we united to Christ in the likeness of his resurrection? What's the corresponding Christian truth? What is it that happens in my life as a result of my union with Christ in his resurrection? 
That's, that's a question. Okay. We are sanctified. Is that where you're going? Or? That, that's absolutely true. So we are sanctified. Like, um, like in Ephesians chapter 6, um, our sanctification is a result of um, our resurrection with, with Christ. Um, there's one um, very particular, uh, Noel, there's one very particular um, truth in the Christian walk related to this. We're made born again. We are uh, regenerated. We are brought back from the dead spiritually. Uh, and eventually there will be a bodily resurrection as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's both of those things. So the first, if you caught what Noel said, is we're regenerated. Now it's called a resurrection because a death took place. Um, when we're united to Christ, we're united in the likeness, likeness of his death as well. The old man is said to be crucified with Christ. And what happens at, um, at our conversion is we're raised with him. And by what power are we raised again to newness of life? It's by the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Um, now, uh, at the consummation, we'll receive a, uh, a new glorified body and our adoption as sons will be publicly demonstrated in receiving that glorified body. And that's also considered the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, Tom? Could you please expand on that a little bit more for us when you said that um, when, you, when you connected Christ's resurrection with our regeneration, um, which comes first, our union with him or our regeneration? Uh, that's a really, really good question. So um, like I said, um, there is a sense in which we're united to Christ before the foundation of the earth, um, but our union with Christ happens at the time of conversion. So um, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about it rightly, because um, I wasn't really, uh, when, I'm, when I was looking at Ephesians 2, I'm not really thinking about the Ordo Salutis at that time. I'm thinking about our union with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Um, I believe that we get um, regenerated and uh, logically following our regeneration is our union with Christ. It's, um, but they all happen simultaneously in time. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. All right. Let's look at... Um, so how are we raised up with him? How are we ascended with Christ? What's the corresponding Christian truth to that? We never think about that. In fact, I was, um, I was uh, uh, while I was studying this text, pacing around trying to, what in the world does that mean? We're raised up with him? We are ascended with Christ? What does that mean? Look at um, Colossians chapter three, really quick. And verse one, if you can keep up with my flipping. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, I think he's referring to the same thing. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, if you don't know um, what corresponding Christian, um, what corresponding truth is to that in your Christian walk, that's okay. Um, what it... <laughs> What I was struck with was how unworthy I was of it. Um, it's a matter of status and stature. Like um, when, when Christ was ascending, what he was actually doing was he was approaching the throne of God to take his rightful place, his place of authority and his place of intercession at the right hand of God. Um, we ascend with Christ. Um, that should uh, humble you as a Christian. You know, you ascend with Christ in status. Um, why? Why in the world? Me, you know, um, uh, when I've plumbed the depths of sin, um, the fact that God would condescend so low to unite me to his son and cause his son to ascend to the throne um, and I ascend with him, that is a... Um, Whatever it is, it's breathtaking, right? It's breathtaking. It is amazing. Um, so he causes us to be resurrected with Christ and to ascend with Christ. And lastly, 
he causes us to be seated with him in the heavenly places. Jesus Christ is sitting on a throne right now and he's sitting down. Why is he sitting down? Because the work that he accomplished on this earth when he became incarnate is finished. Now, um, he was given a place of authority when he sat down at the right hand of God. And yet he's said to be waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool for his feet, right? So have all of Christ's enemies, enemies yet been subjected underneath his feet? No, that happens at the second return of Christ. That, that happens at the second return of Christ when he establishes his um, millennial reign, you see? Um, in, uh, in Colossians chapter two, he said to, uh, what, is, what is the verbiage that's used? He said, flipping all over the place here. Gentiles eat pork chops. Okay, Colossians comes last. <laughs> um, it says, when he had disarmed the, the rulers and authorities, this is Colossians 2.15, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Um, Christ, uh, uh, he, overpower, he overcame several enemies at his death. He overcame the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, spiritually at first, and then it'll be consummated when he returns, you see? So with Christ, my flesh is subdued. Jesus Christ subdued and subjected my flesh, uh, the old man. He became an authority um, and he conquered my flesh. He also conquered this world, the powers of this world. And he conquered the work of um, the devil in my life. And I reign with Christ in those ways. Does that make sense? Yes? Um, that, should be, uh, that should be your consideration um, when you're thinking about your battle against your sin. You're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. This sin doesn't have any dominion over you. Okay? Let's look at the next section for the sake of time. I hope that's... Um, refreshing to you. Think about it. Like, when do we talk about uh, our union with Christ in the likeness of his resurrection, ascension, and session at the right hand of God? We should be thinking about those things. And I don't really think we do. I say that because I don't, but that, um, that's encouraging. That should, that should uh, make you rejoice. Um, yeah, Ryan. I was just thinking how I don't either. Um, and I noticed Paul, like in verse five of Colossians chapter three, he says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. So you can see his mentality is that he's seated oh, in amen. the heavenly places. So when he looks at fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, he thinks of it as on the earth. It's, it's like uh, how many of us say, uh, I'm putting to death the, my, uh, my sins or my, the, my flesh, which is on the earth. Yeah. You know, like, because we don't think of ourselves as, as seated spiritually with Christ. Amen. That's very encouraging. Thank you. All right. Third section. I titled this, A Wall Torn Down to Build One Temple in Him. Yeah, Brianna. Is there a categorical difference between union with ascension and session? Yeah. Yes. So, like, can you kind of explain that a little bit more? Um, yeah, and, and to be perfectly honest with you, like, uh, I was racking my brain over this, and I couldn't find any material on it. So, um, when I was thinking about it, like, uh, when, when the Bible speaks of his um, ascension, it's, uh, it's the period of time between his resurrection and his session. So, um, and yet all three of those periods are uh, identified by theologians as all, all three are identified as his exaltation. So if you look at Philippians chapter two, if you're looking at um, uh, Psalm chapter 16, Psalm chapter 22, um, the ascension of Christ, I, I believe is referring to um, like uh, uh, the way that after a uh, coronation ceremony, a king would, um, this is just a picture, a king would climb the steps to the throne. That is essentially what his ascension was. <laughs> Um, it's, so in my mind, um, in my mind, uh, the way that I'm supposed to apply that to my life is, um, it's a, it's an ascension of status. Like I'm ascending to the throne. Um, 
so that's why it was humbling to me. Now, um, I'm uh, willing and open and uh, ready to uh, receive instruction on that because I don't think that I fully understand it. So, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Ephesians chapter two, and uh, I've, I've blocked out Ephesians two in three, sec- uh, three different sections of the second half. Um, verses 11 through 12 is um, describing the context. So it's an exclusive covenant community. That would be the Jews. And it's called exclusive because the Gentiles are outside. Verses 13 through 18 is referring to how the barrier between those two groups is broken down in Christ. And then verses 19 through 22 is the result. One people, one temple of God in Christ. Make sense? Yes? Okay, thank you. Ephesians 2, let's look at the context, 11 through 12. Therefore, remember that formerly you, he's talking to Ephesians here, Greeks. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, he speaks of in the flesh because spiritually they were Jews, but in the flesh they were Gentiles, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Paul is hitting on the point that um, the work of circumcision is a temporal, fleshly, um, shadowy um, picture of a a spiritual reality. That's why he's kind of like repeating himself. He says, it's performed in the flesh by human hands because there is a circumcision that's not performed in the flesh and that is not performed by human hands. That's called um, the circumcision of the heart, regeneration. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the context of what Paul's about to say to these uh, Ephesians, to these Greeks. He's saying, um, under the old covenant, there was one people of God, which were a biologically related people, the Jews, the nation of the Jews. And you, Ephesians, were at that time during the old covenant um, uh, dispensation, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Why? Because you weren't included in the people of God under that uh, administration, under that uh, covenant. Does that make sense? That's what Paul is saying. So uh, what is the solution? Verse 13, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. That's very encouraging. How are we brought near to God? Not in proximity. He's everywhere. How are we brought near to God in relation? By the blood of Christ. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups. Who are the two groups? The Jews and the Gentiles. He made both of these groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, What did he do do with them? He made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two Jews and Gentiles into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it, having put to death the enmity. So what's Paul talking about here? He says, you Ephesians, Gentiles, were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't recipients of the promises of God under the old covenant. So what did Jesus Christ do when he came? Jesus Christ made both groups into one. Um, we should always be willing to put aside our presuppositions when we come to the word of God. Always. Because what do I want to know? What theological position do I need to hold to? This one. Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the dividing wall. What Jesus Christ did when he died, when he united a people to himself, is he made two groups into one. Who are the people of God? Everyone who's united to Christ. Under the old covenant, 
there were Jews who were lost, you know, like Saul. Saul was a king of Israel. He was lost. <laughs> he was circumcised. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was lost. You're telling me somebody who was in covenant with, with God was lost, was not a recipient of all these promises? That's exactly right. Like, um, uh, not a recipient of the, prom- the eternal promises, the spiritual promises, the spiritual inheritance that we have, the, the inheritance of a Christian. Saul, the Old Testament king who was lost, was not a recipient of those. Why? Because he wasn't united to Christ. So what Jesus Christ does when he unites the people to himself is he breaks down a barrier. He breaks down a dividing wall, which is the old covenant system of um, entering into relationship with God. There's a new covenant, a new covenant. And what Hebrews chapter eight says is when the new comes in with better promises, it makes the old obsolete. That's right. It's, um, it's a grafting into the tree of God. Some branches were taken out when they were uh, not fruitful, when they were uh, unbelieving. Some branches were taken out, even though they were branches. They were the people of God. Those branches were taken out. They were pruned off. And then other branches were grafted in who weren't originally a part of this tree. That's a, that's a picture of the covenant of God, of God described in Romans chapter 11. So let's keep, keep going. What's the result? So then, verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, praise God, but you are fellow, because all of us are Gentiles. <laughs> okay, praise God. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Okay, introducing a new topic, household. What are you talking about? Having been built, built on the foundation. foundation. He's using construction type of terms, right? Of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the the cornerstone. That's what we're named after. (laughs) In whom in Christ, in the cornerstone, the whole building, you see how he's using construction terms? The whole building being fitted together and growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So what does Christ do uh, at the ratification of the new covenant? He makes this old covenant obsolete and everyone in the new covenant is considered uh, uh, the temple of God. There's nothing about this temple um, no, there is no brick that has been placed on this temple that doesn't belong there. Um, God's building a temple right now. You ever think about like, why is this world still turning? Why doesn't God just, you know, be done with it and start the new heavens and the new earth? And It's because he's building a temple. That's the reason that all of this is happening right now. That's the reason that the world is still turning. That reason, because he's still building his temple. He's still adding it brick by brick. And who are the bricks? What are the bricks? We are. Each one of us in this room, if you're a genuine believer in Christ, if you're really united to Christ, you're a brick. I'm not calling you a brickhead. I'm just saying you're a part of the temple of God. <laughs> okay, that should be encouraging. You, you are the temple of God. I'm the temple of God. Awesome. Okay. Let's look at Ephesians chapter three. Go to um, verse 14. There, there's so much to be said, you know. Um, we're really blazing over this. Okay, Ephesians chapter three, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. What's he talking? He's bow, to bow your knees. It's just a figure of speech. He doesn't mean really like I, you know, bow my knees and I, you know, do my little rosary. You know, he's not talking about that. He, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father because it's a figure of speech implying prayer. This is why I pray. That's what... Excuse me, that's, why, uh, that's what Paul's saying. Verse 15, before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Um, real quick, uh, what it means for God to dwell some, like, uh, let, me, let me ask you, what is, it, um, what is Paul implying when he says, uh, when he uses this word dwelling, Christ dwells in your heart by faith. What's he implying? Is that like, um, is that like uh, this, where's my bottle of water? Is that like this bottle of water? Like, um, like this vessel, like I'm a human being and the way that, that Christ dwells in my heart is by filling me up physically. Like he occupies the same space as my blood and my veins and my bones and my muscles and my tendons and my ligaments. No, that's not what it means by dwelling. So what does he mean? What's he referring to when he says that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith? Somebody take a shot at that. Well, we re- we remember. I remember from um, the last book we did. Can't remember um, that God is everywhere and nowhere in particular. So it can't mean what you were saying. But um, in that last book, it pointed out Him dwelling with us covenantally mm-hmm. um, in a personal way with his people. Amen. That's exactly right. Um, so it, it doesn't mean spatially. Okay. I, I thought that for so many years that that's what it meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that that's what it meant um, for him to dwell in me, to abide in me. It's not what it means. It's not spatial. Okay. God is everywhere. You see, he dwells in dogs, he dwells in uh, the ground, he dwells in this air, like God is everywhere. All of him is everywhere all at once. That's what his omnipresence is. That's what his omnipresence is referring to. Um, so it's not spatial, it's, um, it's referring to all of this uh, uh, theology that's undergirding that one statement, covenantally dwelling, the temple of God, doing a personal work, you see? That's what he refers to when he says dwelling. So what does it mean that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith? It means when you exercise faith in Christ, um, he, does a, he, he is doing a personal work in you. And he dwells in you as his temple individually. Um, you individually and corporately are the temple of Christ. So what's the second point under this? It's involved with our union with him, but um, it's a result of it. And I cannot look at Ephesians chapter three without looking at this verse, okay? Verse um, 18. We'll we'll look at verse 17. So uh, he dwells in our hearts through faith. Why? Um, So that we may be able, verse 18, to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth? This is a special text. What is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of God, I'm sorry, the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What's the result of us being united to Christ? Um, There is a love of Christ, which has to it what Paul refers to as a breadth and a length and a height and a depth. The love of Christ um, has these different um, parameters which extend infinitely. And um, what's the application of that? Well, let me ask you, let me me work backwards to depth. Have you ever um, in your Christian walk um, experienced your own um, uh, sin and um, uh, trespassing against God's law for a period of time that you felt so low, low. Um, the psalmist in um, Psalm 130, he said the first verse of this of this chapter, no context. He says, "Out of the depths I've cried to you, O God." Why does he say that? Because of his sin. His sin makes him to feel low. And you know what? There is a love of God which has a depth that goes even lower to the lowest depths that you could reach that sits under you and holds you up. Make sense? 
there is a height to the love of God. No matter what trial you're going through, Christian, or what persecution you're experiencing, no matter how tall it seems, you're not able to get over this thing. There's a love of God which has a height to it, which goes even farther above it. There is a length to the love of God, no matter how far away you feel from him. You feel cold and you feel distant and your arm is just too short to reach out to him. His love extends further and he's able to reach out to you. And there's a breadth. There's a breadth to the love of Christ, which is um, when you're experiencing something, a trial, a persecution, whatever it may be, which seems so wide that you can't get around it. There's a breadth. There's a breadth to the love of Christ, which goes even around that and can reach you. Does that make sense? Does that not warm your heart and humble you that um, the result of our union with Christ is he's never gonna let you go and his love for you has a, a depth and a height and a length and a breadth to it. His love in union with you is suitable and answerable to any difficulty that you can experience in this life. Praise God. That right there is the most special thing that I've um, that I've read in, in, in the book of Ephesians, excuse me, that and maybe um, the ascension with Christ, even though I totally uh, uh, don't totally comprehend it. Let's look at um, Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. And we'll actually start at verse, uh, let's start at verse 10. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the working, uh, I'm sorry, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to the measure of, of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's the background of what we're about to read. In other words, Christ ascended, he gave gifts, gifts to the church, and um, the purpose of those gifts is so that he can unite us all together in the body of Christ, okay? So that we can grow to a unity of the faith. And, uh, and how does he put it? He says, so that we may attain <clears throat> to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, verse 14, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by uh, craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking truth, I'm sorry, speaking the truth in love, here it is, we are to grow up in all aspects into him, who is the head, even Christ. What's, in what sense is he a head? He's a head of his body, which is the church. From whom, from this head, from Christ, the whole body, us, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, we are gonna look at that, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Who causes the growth of the body? It's the head. It's Jesus Christ. Who is the body? His people, the church. Every saved person, every saved person found in local churches, okay? So let's look at a couple things here. Um, as you know, Paul has been, he's had this, uh, this theme of, uh, I'm sorry, the temple of God in these chapters. He's had that theme underlying there. It's here too. Um, but instead of uh, referring to himself as the cornerstone, he refers to himself as the head. And instead of referring to us as the bricks, he refers to us as the body. Now it's, uh, it may seem to you as ironic that beforehand, he said that we were the temple. Now he calls us the body. So let me ask you a question. Is the body of Christ and the temple of Christ the same thing? Yes? 
No. Are they two different things? They're the same thing. They're the same thing. Let's look at, um, and, and I'm going to surprise you right now. Let's look at John chapter two. Real quick. John chapter two, if you can flip there. And we're going to look at verse 18. This is after Jesus Christ goes into the temple and he's whipping around with a, 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 a cord, uh, what, is it, what is it called? A whip, okay, it's a whip. And uh, verse 18, the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show as your authority for doing these things? He just went into the temple and started whipping <laughs> because they were making his, uh, uh, the house of God a, a robber's den, his house of prayer a robber's den. So they say, what sign do you show us of your authority to do that? Jesus's response is really interesting. He's gonna, um, he's gonna give them a sign, the sign of Jonah. He says, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it up. Now, let me ask you, what's he referring to when he says destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it up? His body. Now, isn't it interesting that in Ephesians, we find that his body is the church and his body, the church, is the temple. And here he's responding to the Pharisees and he's speaking of his body, his human nature. And he says, this body is the temple and it's the body of Christ. Um, There is so much theology there and it's a theology of union with Christ. His human nature is the temple of God. Think about it, the dwelling place of God. Um, God, uh, at the introduction of the New Testament, God the Son um, veiled himself in a human nature. He dwelled in a human nature. He made, uh, he tabernacled among us. His human nature is the temple. You see? Yeah, Noel. Uh, I just have a question to clarify. In John chapter 2, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm understanding you correctly. Mm-hmm. So I'm, really what I'm looking for is for clarification. Mm-hmm. Are you saying that in John chapter 2 when he says the body, he's referring to the body of Christ as in us, the believers, or just his physical body, or both? Good question. I mean, uh, I think he's talking about his physical body, you know? Okay. He's talking about his human nature. He's not... He's not um, he is not talking about the church there, and yet, by virtue of our union with him, we died with him. We did, <laughs> we did die with him. Destroy this temple. Were we destroyed at Christ's death? Yes, because we were united to him, you see? But he was talking about his human nature, okay? Um, for the sake of time, let's look at um, Ephesians 5. Let's move on. Ephesians 5, verse 25. This is the last section. And I titled it, Christ, One Flesh with His Bride. Husbands, love your wives. We've got a responsibility, husbands. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. There it is again. Uh, A husband's bride is to be loved like a husband's own body. There's a reason for that, okay? Um, So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Uh, Let's skip down for a little bit. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. What, what's that verse referring to? That verse is referring to Jesus and his bride. You see, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna turn to Song of Solomon, chapter one, and verse four. The bride is speaking, and she says to her husband, Draw me after you 
and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. Um, because we're out of time, this should be um, a point of meditation for you. Like I said at the beginning, we're gonna talk about things that we don't normally think about. And the Bible speaks in unequivocal terms. The Bible speaks very um, br um, brutally. It speaks straightforward. It doesn't hold back things that God designed for um, our good. Intimacy is one of those things. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about intimacy in the church because God's not afraid to talk about it in his word. Make sense? Um, uh, intimacy is natural revelation or general revelation. Intimacy is supposed to teach us something. There is a spiritual reality that is the counterpart of intimacy and our special revelation interprets that for us. So what does Paul say in um, 1 Corinthians chapter five? He who's united himself to Christ has become one spirit with him. Union with Christ is the spiritual counterpart to intimacy. And um, we're out of time, but that should be a, something that you meditate on, husbands, wives. Um, he designed intimacy for a purpose. Single men, single women, you should think about that. Like, um, there's a purpose to it. It's not um, purposeless, meaningless, um, but God designed it to communicate something to us, okay? Let's, uh, let's pray. You are so merciful, oh God. We are so thankful to you for your special revelation, how you teach us um, from your word about yourself. We are um, uh, very far beneath you, but there's a love that reaches down even farther. We are uh, so grateful to you. We lift up our hearts in praise to you, speechless before your word as you tell us of all the wonderful things that you've planned for us.